Hi everybody. Today's video is going to focus on language development. So get your notes ready. Hopefully you're using some Cornell note system to kind of keep track of what we're doing here uh, to help you encode and remember the information for later. We're going to take a look at some objectives first. This comes from the National AP standards. So after this video, you should be able to do some of these things. We'll talk about some of them in class later as well. You should be able to define language and the symbols and sounds that are used to convey meaning and facilitate communication, which can involve the structure of language and how language functions. You should be able to recognize that language is organized in a hierarchical structure, and you should be able to describe what those structures are. We're going to examine the influence of language on your thinking. The type of language you use and can use certainly affects your ability to think and reason. And we're going to evaluate some theories of language development and language acquisition because there are a couple different theories on how we develop our language. And we're done with that, so let's move on here. I guess I'm repeating things here. Okay. Sorry about that. So let's take a look at language. Basically we're going to cover language structure and language development in this first video. In a second video we're going to talk about how language influences our thinking and our ability to reason and how we think in images. And on your own you should be reading in um, our AP text about animals and thinking and language. The question is do animals think and do animals actually develop a language? Um, we know they can probably um, communicate, but is that a distinct language? And you should be aware of a couple of famous cases using primates and sign language. So here we go. Language. By definition, uh, languages are spoken, written, or gestured words, and it's how we communicate meaning to ourselves and others. And also, very importantly, language allows us to transmit culture from person to person or generation to generation. We're going to look at the structure of language, so we're going to break language down into its really small components. That first small component um, is, is called phonemes. And think of phone as hearing and sound. Phonemes are the smallest distinct sound in spoken language. So every sound of a word has a distinct phoneme. Let's take a look at some examples. The word bat actually has three phonemes. So if you say that word really, really slowly and enunciate each specific sound, it's going to sound something like b, a, and t, bat. So bat has three phonemes in a word, um, three letters. Chat has four letters, but it still has three phonemes because the CH that replaced B in the previous word in our language has a distinct sound. Ch. So chat also has three phonemes. But what about the word school? Think about that. Can you break the distinct sounds in that word into its simplest components, into more into phonemes? Hopefully you identified that school has four phonemes. S is a separate sound. CH is a separate distinct sound. The two O's has a very unique sound in our language. And L has a unique sound. So S-K-U-L. School has four phonemes. Total, the English language has about 40 phonemes, which means not only does each of our letters in the alphabet have a distinct sound, 26 letters, 26 sounds. Some of those letters have more than one phoneme. For example, A has two phonemes, A and A. So does I. Most of the vowels have several phonemes, or a couple phonemes at least, and then some of the um, letter combinations have their own distinct phonemes. But ING, OO, CH, SH, TH, those are some letter combinations that have their own phonemes. Another small distinct uh, 
structure of language are called morphemes. Think of morphemes as meaningful structures. This is the smallest unit in language that carries a very distinct meaning. It can be a whole word that stands by itself, or it can be parts of words that change the meaning of words. For example, this word, milk, is one morpheme. It, you can't break that word down into smaller parts that are useful and meaningful. How about this word, pumpkin? Pumpkin can be broken down into two distinct units that changes the meaning of the word. Now we're not, be careful here, we're not just looking at syllables. We're looking at the smallest unit of a word that carries useful and distinct meaning. So let's look at, ooh, that sounds like an interesting word, unforgettable. Unforgettable has three morphemes. Forget is a distinct word, even though it has two syllables. If we're talking about memory, forget has one distinct meaning, so that's one morpheme. If you put an UN in front um, and an ABLE at the end, it changes the meaning, so it alters forget, which means I can't remember or I can't retrieve a memory, to something that is impossible not to be able to remember. So morphemes aren't just syllables, they're distinct units of a word that changes or alters the meaning of the word. Let's practice. Let's try this morpheme. I'll give you a few seconds. You can talk to somebody about this as well if you're nearby. So that has three morphemes. Remember, it's very important that we're not counting syllables. We're looking at distinct units of a word that change or alter meaning or that have meaning. So here's a quick review. Remember, phonemes are basic sounds. There's about 40 in the English language. Morphemes are the smallest meaningful units in the English language. There's about 100,000 of these. Prefixes, prefixes suffixes, etc. There's about 290,000 words in the English language, and if we connect two or more words to make a phrase, we have about 326,000 of those. And with those words, phrases, morphemes, we really have about an infinite number of sentences we can create using those. Let's take a quick look at grammar. I know it's all our favorite topic. Uh, grammar is basically a system of rules in any language that enables us to communicate and understand, understand others who are using the same language. So it's kind of a system of rules, really broken down into two parts. Uh, the first part is called semantics, and another part is called syntax. You've probably heard of these words. One of these words, semantic, we'll use also in a unit on memory. So if you've had adolescent psych, you might understand and remember that semantics means or has something to do with meaningfulness, an encoding process. Let's look at semantics in the English language quickly. This is a set of rules by which we can derive meaning from our morphemes, from our words, and from our sentences. So semantics is about how we structure our language to to get meaning from statements. We have a semantic rule that tells us adding ed to the end of words, like laugh, means it happened in the past. So that's a semantic rule. Adding ed means past tense, laughed, something that happened in the past. Syntax, on the other hand, basically deals with rules that we use in our language, or any language, to combine words into sentences that we can semantically um, encode. For example, in English, there's a syntactical rule that adjectives come before nouns, like the adjective white comes before the noun house. We're talking about, oh yeah, our house. We, have, we live in a white house. In Spanish, that language has a different syntax rule. Basically, the adjectives coming before nouns is reversed. So if you were talking about your white house in Spanish, you would say Casa Blanca, Casa House, Blanca White. 
so not that White House. <laughs>